السلام عليكم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Peace and blessings of Allah be upon you Welcome respected brothers and sisters and guests Before we begin I'd like to thank Jamaat al Mini Association who has kindly allowed us to use their hall uh, We just asked for a gold coin donation on my left hand side there So tonight's dialogue, peaceful dialogue, is does the Bible foretell the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Each speaker tonight will talk for 25 minutes each. There will be 10 minutes each for the first rebuttal. There will be another 10 minutes for the second rebuttal. And then 90 seconds each for closing statements. We will be leaving 10 minutes each for question time. And all questions must be written and directed at either speaker and must be related to tonight's topic. And again, tonight's topic is, does the Bible foretell the coming of the Prophet Muhammad? Peace and blessings be upon him. So before I introduce tonight's speakers, I'll just outline some house rules. In the event of an evacuation, we've got an entry, an entry door through here and we've got an entry at the back. Exit. If your car is blocking anyone's driveway or blocking another car outside, we ask that you please move it now. We don't like to get interrupted during the uh, debate. Also, if you switch off your mobile phones or keep them on silent, and if you do need to take a call, then you can go from the rear. The back door will be kept open throughout the whole, uh, during the dialogue. This front door here will be kept closed. Bathroom facilities are on the left hand side, the third, third door from, 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 the, from the front. There's, there's no smoking in the confinements of this building and that includes outside as well. Um, we ask that there is no yelling or shouting, no takbir, no interrupting the speakers. We ask that you respect both speakers' opinions tonight and again this is a peaceful dialogue. So we've, tonight's first speak, well, both our speakers here, I'm pretty sure everybody knows them very well. You've, a lot of you have, have been here many, many times. We've got Reverend Samuel Green and we've got uh, Mustafa Aja. So our first speaker for tonight, I'd, I'd welcome up Samuel Green. Thank you. Well, good evening and thank you for coming this evening. Uh, I'd like to greet everyone in the name of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and to my Muslim friends, Assalamu Alaikum. I'd like to thank the organisers of this event for uh, taking the seriousness to, to organise something like this and, and I want to again thank you for coming this evening. Tonight the question is, does the Bible foretell the coming of Muhammad? Now why are we even asking this question? Well, we're asking this question because of claims that are made within the Quran itself regarding this. If you look at point A on your notes there, you'll see it says, those who follow the messenger, the prophet, the Ummi, whom they will find described in the Torah and the Gospel, which are with them. Or point B. And when Jesus, son of Mary, said, Children of Israel, I am indeed the messenger of God to you, confirming the Torah that is before me, and giving glad tidings of a messenger who shall come after me, whose name shall be Ahmed. And so the Quran actually puts forward, as part of the proof for Muhammad being a genuine prophet, these references, these two references, that he is foretold and described in the earlier prophets, particularly mentioned here, the, the Torah and the Gospel. And so this is one thing we need to realise with the Quran. It just doesn't call for blind faith. It actually puts forward certain evidences for you to consider. It's very interesting that at this point there's an overlap with Christianity because as you see at point C in your notes from Luke 24 verse 44 that Jesus said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And so Jesus himself puts forward as evidence for his own authenticity that he is spoken about and foretold in the earlier prophets. Now the verses that I just mentioned from the Quran, they're particularly addressed to Christians, uh, Christians and to some degree Jews, and it's, it's appealing to their scriptures saying this is why you should accept Muhammad. And I want to say up front that if Muhammad is indeed foretold in the earlier scriptures in the Christian Bible, then we should accept him. 
we should accept him. But if he's not foretold, then we should not accept him. And this is a very serious question that we should take seriously. And again, I'm really thankful that we can do this work tonight. It may be hard for you to listen to some of the things that I'm going to say tonight because taking the Christian position, I'm going to be saying that we shouldn't accept Muhammad and that he's not foretold in the Bible. And so if you're a Muslim, you may find that hard to listen to. All I can ask is please consider the manner in which I'm presenting this material and the references that I'm putting forward uh, before you. Well, the first thing I need to address is what actually is the Bible? And you've got a small table there on your notes. The Bible is the... It contains the books of the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel. Christians believe all the prophets and we make no distinction between any of them. And what we believe comes from all the prophets and we read them all. And that's why we have all of the prophets, as I said, the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel in the Bible. If you were to go to a church, you may actually hear any one of these prophets being read on any Sunday. Now when the Quran is talking about Muhammad being foretold, it's referring to the scriptures that the Jews and the Christians have. Look at point A. No, it's not point A, is it? In your notes there, the next point, where it says, those who follow the prophet Muhammad, the prophet, the, the Umi, whom they, find, whom they will find described in the Torah and the Gospel, which are with them. And it's quite clear there, my Arabic isn't fantastic, but it's something like, indahum which is with them. And then point D, and when there come, comes to them, the Jews are scripture, the Quran from Allah, confirming that which is with their, or in their possession. And that's uh, ma'ahum. And the idea is that it's actually with them. So it's not referring to scriptures in the past, but it's referring to the scriptures that are with them at their time. And we've got some references to, to how Muhammad treated these scriptures that we may come back to later on. And so the Quran is referring to the scriptures that the Christians and Jews have and it's saying, look at these for your proof that Muhammad is foretold, that he, he is in these books. These are the books that we have from the, in the Bible today because we actually have Bibles from this time and actually before this time. And so we know what our scriptures are from the 7th century. So is Muhammad foretold in the Bible? When we come to answer this question, it's slightly different to how we find it in the New Testament or how we find it in the Gospel. When we read the Gospel accounts, it will actually quote the Torah, the Prophets and the Psalms and say, this is how Jesus fulfills this. Now the Quran doesn't do that. It just says that he is foretold there. It doesn't actually give a reference. It doesn't give a quote the way the Gospel does. So it's a little bit different when we come to consider it. I want to consider today the three classic scriptures that Muslim leaders put forward and to see whether or not they do indeed point to the coming of Muhammad. And then I'm going to look at uh, how Jesus fulfills the prophets so you can see how Jesus does it, and it gives us something to contrast against. Well, here we go. The first one, Deuteronomy 18. This is a classic scripture that Muslim leaders will bring up. Let me read to you from uh, point G on your notes. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will... Tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods must be put to death. Now, Muslim leaders say of this scripture that Muhammad is the prophet like Moses. In particular, they would say that when it is saying that there is a prophet from among their brothers that this is referring to the Ishmaelites who were a brother nation to the Israelites. I have a question at this point as to where the Quran says this. I know it is widely uh, understood within Islam that Muhammad is a descendant of Ishmael and I'm keen to get a reference for where that is. Uh, is there a reference in the Quran for that? Now Christians don't accept Muhammad as the prophet like Moses for, for four reasons that I'm going to outline. First of all, when it says from among their brothers, this actually means, just in the, the context of Deuteronomy, from amongst their brother Israelites. Let me just read to you from the chapter before where we see this talking about the king of Israel and the same phrase is used in Deuteronomy 17 verse 15. You are to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. Appoint a king from your brothers. You are not to set a foreigner over you 
or one who is not of your people or of your brothers. And so the normal way that it, it just means when it says your brothers, it's talking about their fellow Israelites. If it wants to say the brother nations, and it always puts in the phrase, uh, like in chapter 2, verse 4 of Deuteronomy, where it talks about the, the brother nation of the Edomites or the Ammonites or somebody like that, but it always specifies who it means. So when it just says your brothers, it means your Israelite brothers. And so we don't accept that Muhammad was an Israelite, and you're not claiming that. And so we don't see that Muhammad is a prophet like Moses. Secondly, as you can see in chapter 18, verse 20, the prophet is not to presume to speak anything in the name of God. Yet when we read the Islamic histories, we find a very well-documented time where Muhammad did do this. And again, I've given you the references here, and there's a few, few more you can follow up, where it's reported that Muhammad said, I ascribed to Muhammad, sorry, I ascribed to Allah what he had not said. And I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. And this is actually very well documented, and in fact it says at point K in your notes from a, an Islamic scholar who's done a thorough research on this, that the Satanic Verses incident constituted a standard element in the historical memory of the early Muslim community for the first 150 years of Islam. So this is not just some quote that I've pulled out of nowhere. This is well documented and uh, a standard early element. And therefore, I see that there's a presumption in speaking in God's name, which means you're not a prophet like Moses. Secondly, to be a prophet like Moses, you need to agree with him. You need to agree with him, at least on the, the fundamentals. But in the law of Moses, we see that God made us in his image. Now, this is in the table in front of you there. We see that God made us in his image. In the Torah, the law of Moses, we see that God is Father. We see that Israel is called the Son of God. We see that God dwells with his people. We see that there is a substitute sacrifice for sin. And when you look at those, you see that they're not just in the Torah, but they're the way that you understand God in the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms, and the Gospel. Now, the Quran doesn't have any of those. We're not made in the image of God in Islam, particularly Surah 42, verse 11. God is never spoken of as being Father. There is certainly no Son of God. Not even God's people are allowed to call themselves the sons of God in Surah 5, verse 18. God doesn't dwell with his people. And there is no sacrifice or substitute sacrifice for sin. The one I particularly want to look at, though, which is most stark for me, is the, the use of sacred stones. Because in the Torah and the prophets, and to be a prophet like Moses, you need to agree with him at these basics, sacred stones were not allowed. So look at point L. Do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves. And do not place a carved stone in the land or bow down to it. I am the Lord your God. Yet we actually find that this, uh, that, that the the pre-Islamic practice of sacred stones that Moses is actually writing against, and I've got a point M for you there, which you, are, you can look at. Uh, we used to worship stones, and when we found a better one than the first, we would throw the first one and take the latter. And then he talks about performing tawaf around these sacred stones. Now we read in point N that Muhammad continued this practice. Point N. Bukhari, Muslim, and Abu Dawud reported that Umar approached the black stone and kissed it. Then he said, I know that you are a mere stone that can neither harm nor do any good. If I had not seen the prophet, peace be upon him, kissing you, I would never have kissed you. So you see, there's a hesitation there, isn't there? There's a reluctance, but he will do it because he saw Muhammad do it. Now, al qatabi said, This shows that abiding by the sunnah of the prophet, peace be upon him, is binding regardless of whether or not we understand the wisdom or the reason behind it. Such information devolves obligation on all to whom it reaches, even if they may not fully comprehend its significance. It is known, however, that kissing the black stone signifies respect for it, recognition of our obligation toward it, and using it as a means of seeking Allah's blessing. Now again, the law of Moses said no to sacred stones and this type of practice. So this is the other reason why we would say that Muhammad is not a prophet like Moses. But you may say, yes, but Muhammad did teach that there is one God. There is only one God and that's what matters. And it is true that Muhammad did teach that. But I want to say that so did Aristotle, uh, one of the great Greek philosophers. 
You see, that the one God of the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel made us in His image. He dwells with us. He is the Father. There is the Son of God. There is the substitute sacrifice for sin. This one God has all of those characteristics. Now, the Quran does teach one God, but its concept of God has none of those. In fact, it's, it's a lot closer. The Islamic concept of God is not the same, but it's a lot closer to Aristotle's concept of God. And so we do not see that Muhammad is a prophet like Moses when those characteristics of the one God are left out. Finally, the Gospel actually declares that Jesus is the prophet like Moses. You see this in a number of places. There's a famous event in the Gospel books called the Transfiguration. And in all of those, when Jesus is transfigured and and is glorified, God speaks from heaven and he, he quotes two scriptures. He quotes Isaiah 42 about the suffering servant. But he also quotes Deuteronomy 18 about listening to the prophet. And so if you read those, those transfiguration accounts, you'll see they're talking about the prophets who are to come. And Jesus is identified as the prophet to come like Moses. This is again picked up in Acts chapter 3 verses 13 to 23. And so I want to argue that Jesus is the prophet like Moses. The Gospel declares it. He's an Israelite like Moses, he did miracles like Moses, and he fulfills all of those concepts that I mentioned before from the Torah. He is the prophet like Moses. Well, the second scripture I want to look at now is the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 16. And this is another famous one that, is, uh, that is, uh, I hear Muslims using. It's actually a wedding song, and I'll just read a few verses from it now. O daughters of Jerusalem, it's point O on your notes. O daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my lover, what will you tell him? Tell him that I am faint with love. How is your, how is your beloved better than others, most beautiful of women? How is your beloved better than others, that you charge us so? And then she gives a description of how she is, how she is so passionately in love with her, uh, her husband or fiancé at this time. And then in verse 15, His legs are pillars of marble, set on bases of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as its cedars. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. He is my lover, this my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, the Hebrew word for altogether lovely is claimed by Muslim leaders to be the word Muhammad, And so this is an indication that Muhammad is foretold here. Now Christians don't accept this for a few reasons. Firstly, the very context. It's a wedding song and it's a passionate wedding song. And so there's no natural connection between this song and Muhammad. We'd have to establish that. Secondly, the Hebrew word is actually not Muhammad, but as it appears in the scriptures there, it's uh, Makamadim. And it's actually in the plural, not in the singular. And so it's not, it's not really indicating an individual. The singular word is Mahmud. And again, this is not really like Muhammad. Thirdly, the word Mahmud is often used in the prophets in a number of other places. And so if Muhammad is foretold here, we can look at that word being used elsewhere, this exactly the same word, to see whether or not that would make sense to use it as Muhammad's name elsewhere. And we can see that at point P. Look at, uh, this is from one of the histories of, of uh, the books of the, the prophets of the histories of Israel. And it says, But about this time tomorrow, I am going to send my officials to search your palace and the houses of your officials. They will seize everything of value or of Muhammad and carry it away. Now, you can't put the word Muhammad there, can you? He's just saying, My soldiers are going to come, they're going to take everything of value from your palace. It's not that Muhammad's in the palace. It's not referring to an individual. So as you can see, the word simply means of beauty, of value, of treasure. And to translate it as a name doesn't actually make any sense. It's just taking that verse out of context. And so Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 16, is not about Muhammad. The next one I'd like to look at is John chapter 14. Again, another famous one that is put forward. Let me read it to you from point Q on your notes. And uh, Jesus is speaking and he says, I will pray to the Father and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever. That's John 14 verse 16. And the claim is that this is a reference to Muhammad. Now Christians do not accept this 
for several reasons. The first is just reading it in context. If you just read a few verses later, we read this in point, in point R. Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And so Jesus specifically says that it's the Holy Spirit who is coming. And then as we continue to read the Gospel of John, we see that in verse uh, point S, that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And so the disciples of Jesus received the Spirit. And then in point T, we see that at the beginning of the book of Acts that what Jesus said would happen is happening. He, Jesus, was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And then in point U, this is the day of Pentecost now, and it says that all of them, all of the disciples of Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. And so we see that Jesus promises the coming of the Spirit and that we then see the Spirit being given for teaching and empowering at several stages after this. This is actually something that the Torah, the prophets and the Psalms said would happen. You see it at point V on your notes. Uh, from the Torah, but Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And so there's this expectation in the Torah of the spirit of God being given. And then in the prophet Ezekiel, again, these are prophets before Jesus, point W, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. And point X, and from the book of Joel, again before Jesus, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit. And so the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms all foretell about the giving of God's Spirit to his people. We see Jesus coming and doing this. And so there is no grounds to say that when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit that he's talking about Muhammad. In fact, when I've read the Quran, I've seen that the Spirit of God is mentioned there. And so if anything, when Jesus is talking about the Spirit of God, he'd be talking about the Spirit of God that the Quran talks about, not Muhammad. Now they're the three verses that I, uh, that I wanted to consider that are commonly used. I now want to look at some other evidence which shows that Muhammad is not foretold in the earlier scriptures. And this is particularly two books. One's called The Gospel According to Islam and The Gospel of Barnabas. Let me just read to you from the introduction of The Gospel According to Islam. Uh, this book, as you can see in the reference, was written in 1979. The book before you is a gospel. It is written in the light of the revelation of God that, that God made to the prophet Muhammad. This outline is supplemented in this book by some background material, most, mostly derived from the New Testament and sometimes transformed according to the Quranic revelation, to form a gospel approximately the size of Mark. As we said earlier, this book is, is offered as a new gospel, a Muslim equivalent of and alternative to the existing gospels. Now this Muslim author is very clear as what he's doing there, isn't he? He's saying, I'm presenting this as a new gospel. I've taken the, the, the gospel of Mark and I've taken the Quran and I've transformed the gospel of Mark to make it agree with the Quran. Now I want to, I want to say, first of all, that's shameful to actually do that. And uh, the gospel of Barnabas, uh, his scholars tell us, was from the 14th century and it follows that same type of pattern. You see, if Muhammad was foretold in the Gospel, you wouldn't need to write these Gospels. You could just refer to them. In fact, this is what Christians have done. You see, when Christians believed the Gospel, when the early Christians believed the Gospel, they started to read the Torah, they started to read the Prophets, they started to read the Psalms. Because Jesus was foretold and they were able to keep all the earlier Scriptures and they certainly never rewrote them. And, and that's actually where I want to finish now, just with my last points. To, for a Muslim to actually feel what it's like for a Christian here, because Christians are used to the idea of a prophet being foretold. And so what I'd like you to do is just come with me and see how Jesus is foretold and see how different it is. Just the clarity that we find with Jesus. First of all, the nature of Jesus' conception was revealed by the prophet Isaiah around 700 years before Jesus. Look at point Z. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and shall give birth to a son. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Or, and the place of, the, of Jesus' birth, the Messiah, was also revealed through the prophet Micah again about 700 years. 
But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old, from ancient times. And the signs that would come with the Messiah, and oh, sorry, of course, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And then the signs that would accompany the Messiah and the coming of the new age that he would bring. You see that in B1 there. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue will shout for joy. And if you read any of the Gospels, that's exactly what Jesus does when he comes. It talks about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem in the prophet Zechariah about 500 years before Jesus. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fold of a donkey. And that's exactly how Jesus entered Jerusalem. The new covenant that Jesus speaks about on, the, on his Passover meal before his death is again... Uh, foretold in the prophet Jeremiah at D1. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And finally, the death and the resurrection of Jesus and his salvation for all is particularly seen in the book of Isaiah in Isaiah 53. And I've just given you a few verses here um, from the chapter, but you're more than welcome to look them all up. It says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You see, the, the manner of Jesus' death, the, 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 the signs that would accompany him... His, uh, his death, resurrection and the salvation he would bring are all clearly spelt out in the prophets before Jesus. And this is why when Christians look at what the evidence Muslims give us, we say that's nowhere near as clear as what we have in Jesus. So to conclude, is Muhammad foretold in the Bible? I want to say no, he's not. He's not foretold. The verses that Muslims put forward do not stand up to scrutiny when they're examined. In fact, some Muslims have even gone so far as to rewrite Gospels to make them foretell the coming of Muhammad. If you look at how Jesus is foretold, you can see that it is clear. And it's this clarity that makes Christians say we don't see this clarity with Muhammad and therefore he is not foretold. I ask you all to stay with the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel and what they teach about God. Thank you very much.